reverend fathers, devoted sisters, beloved lady, all friends in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is with a great deal of delight and expectation that I introduce to you Archbishop Fulton Sheen. This brings back memories of days spent in Rome when I first met Archbishop Sheen, then Monsignor Sheen, when he preached in St. Susanna's Church shortly after the signing of the Concordat between the Italian government and the Vatican. And I can still remember the message that the Archbishop propounded then. But so that we are under the right impression about what is taking place in the Diocese of Gary. This is a retreat for the clergy to which the sisters, the laity, are invited. Archbishop will be then addressing the priests primarily, but you're invited so that you know what is expected of the priests. For so much depends on the holiness of the priest. Your own spiritual welfare is intimately tied in with the priesthood. And hopefully as the result of this unique experience, the spiritual welfare of all the people of God and the Church of Gary will be furthered and we will day by day come closer to each other and always just a little nearer to God our Father. And so it is with a great deal of delight that I present to you His Excellency Archbishop Fulton Sheen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, the night of the Last Supper, Thou didst promise to send Thy Spirit, who would recall all things that Thou didst say. Send forth Thy Spirit, that we may love thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Fathers, sisters, friends, all. This is a new concept of a retreat. I've been giving retreats for 50 years, and about two years ago, I found them a little too circumscribed. We were in spiritual ghettos of retreat houses. And now when I'm invited anywhere to give a retreat, I ask the bishop if he will open it to everybody. But the retreat is directed primarily to priests, to sisters and to laity, if I were talking about preaching, the relation of pastors and curates and the like, it would have no interest for you. But as you will discover, I will be talking only about the good Lord. When one talks on that subject, the elephants 
why the priests can drink. And the sisters and others are the birds that can sip. But there'll be something for all of you. Our first conference is going to be about spirituality. What has happened to it? Why are we so confused? Remember, we used to have one extreme in spirituality about 20 or 30 years ago. I am holier than thou. Now we've gone to the other extreme. I am worthier than thou. With the result that we're confused. Which is right? Well, let us begin by telling you that something great has happened in the last 20 or 30 years. There have been two great movements. One is the church has gone into the world. The other movement, the world is coming into the church. First, the church has gone into the world. Now, just imagine this was the, this, the Cathedral of St. Peter's. In World War I, Benedict XV was crowned at the altar at the far end of the Basilica of St. Peter's about as far from the front door as he could get. Pius XI moved forward about 75, 100 feet. He was crowned under the great dome. Pius XII walked down the nave of St. Peter's, up some stairs in the wall. And when he went into that balcony, he literally stepped into the world. John the 23rd, down St. Peter's, up the stairs, out into the balcony, and then he reached out those great arms of his, almost like the carnal columns of Bernini, and bade the whole world come to himself, and her gloriously reigning Pope Paul VI went out the front door and was crowned in the world in the Piazza of St. Peter. That's one thing that's been happening into the world. Second movement, the world has come into the church. Council of Trent, which was held 400 years ago, was a Latin council. The church was Mediterranean. It was not cosmic. In Vatican Council I in 1870, there was not one single bishop from Asia or Africa. Not one. In Vatican Council II, 60% of the bishops were from Asia, Africa, North and South America. The church is no longer Mediterranean, no longer Latin. For the first time in the history of the church, all the nations of the world mingle their dust with the dust of St. Peter. As a result of this double movement, the Vatican Council in chapter 13 wrote about the church in the world. And the church became conscious of our duty and our relationship to the world. Immediately after that chapter 13 was written, Just recall to your minds the things that were popular in those days. The word, word involvement, for one thing. Harvey Cox, 
the kingdom of God equals the secular city. Then we had a movement on the part of sisters and priests to become more and more concerned with the things of the world. Now all of this had something right about it. But there was also something wrong. All that we talked about was the world without making the distinction that the scripture makes. Now here's where all the confusion began. What is the world? What is it? Scripture gives two definitions of the world. The one, it is the theater of redemption. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. And in the epistle of the Colossians, the whole cosmos is Christ. Only this planet knew his earth-visiting feet. But the world was made by God, and Christ came to put a cross on it. It was good. But the world also has another meaning. Now remember very well the day that the speech was given in the Vatican Council by a bishop from Belgium on this distinction. The other definition of the world is, is a spirit. Our blessed Lord said of that world, I pray not for the world. taken you out of it. If I left you in the world, the world would love you. For the world loved you. And again our Lord said, I pray not for the world. So there are two concepts of the world. But we didn't make that distinction. We didn't make the distinction between the world and worldliness. And the result was there began to be confusion in the church among the priests, the religious, and the laity. Were we to give up the sanctuary? Has the church any place? Is teaching worthwhile? Now, as a result of this confusion, two things happened. The first effect of this confusion was retreats became nothing but discussions. So that the priests and sisters would meet together and have a bull session. No spirituality, you would discuss social, political, and economic subjects. It's interesting that all of that is past now, because when I receive invitations from bishops and from priest councils, one of the conditions of the invitation is, you're not going to have discussions like we used to, are you? Now discussions have a place. But they were substitutes for retreats. And I can see a great advantage in a discussion. Believe me, it would be much easier to turn this retreat into a discussion. Because when you have a discussion, the retreat master never has to be prepared. All he does is just simply throw out a question. Let everybody fight over the bone. And secondly... A discussion is an escape from decision. 
conversation. As long as we talk about something, we feel we're doing something about it. And we're not concerned about our soul and our relationship to God. Remember the woman at the well whom our Lord met at high noon? She was very disrespectful to him. He gradually led her around to the moral question of the fact that she had five husbands and was living with a man who was not now her husband. Now that's meddling when you do that. That's getting too close. So what did she do? She said, let's discuss. Let's have a theological problem. Where should we worship on this hill as we Samaritans do, or in Jerusalem as do the Jews? The discussion was an escape from decision. That was the first effect of the confusion of the double meaning of world. But that today is past. The second is very serious. We've dropped Christ. The casualty of all of our attitudes in the last ten years has been Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. When we drop certain things in the church, the world picks them up. We drop mysticism, the youth picked up pharmaceuticals for a false mysticism. The nuns dropped the long habits, the girls put on maxi coats. We stop saying the rosaries and the hippies put them around their necks. And we give up Christ, and who picks up Christ? The theater. So that we have pop Jesuses. Jesus is used. So books on Jesus and revolution, Jesus and homosexuality, Jesus and lust, Jesus and sex. We use him. So in hair, what is he? Jesus that justifies lust. Superstar, what is he? Jesus in rebellion. God spelled Jesus. Because we've dropped him, the world has picked him up, Barbara said, Lord said, and they will say to you, there is Christ, and there is Christ, and there is Christ. Believe it not. Believe it not. What books do you find today on our blessed Lord? On the church? Hundreds. They're all the same, they're all against it. You read one, you read all of them. But you do not find many books on the Lord. So the crucifix is taken down from hospitals, schools. Look at this silver pectoral cross I'm wearing. I received a telephone call one day from a Jewish jeweler whom I had known for about 20 years. He said, I have a hundred silver crucifixes. Would you like to have them? I went down to his shop. 
He had them all in a bag. I said, where did you get these? He said, the nuns brought them in. They said they weren't going to use crucifixes anymore. Crucifix divided them from the world. They wanted to know how much I would give them for the silver in the crucifix. And the Jew said, I weighed them out 30 pieces of silver. He said to me, what's wrong with your church? I thought the crucifix meant something to you. So I told him what was wrong. And three months later, I received him into the church. So I wear this crucifix in reparation for the surrender, the giving up of Christ. Let me tell you, there is no spirituality, priestly spirituality, sisters, or laity, without him. We are consecrated to God anyway. We can't work well, we can't live well unless we're in love. Nobody can. And so we have to love him, not a virtue. We're not acquiring humility. We love him, then humility follows. Sometimes we stay away from him because, well, he reveals us to ourselves. And that's quite uncomfortable very often. But the Lord and Savior must be the center of our spirituality. We have to get back to Him. We think we know Him. Do we really know Him? Really. We've been inoculated with him very often. And we've been inoculated with smallpox. So why should I study more? Why should I pick up the Gospels? I know him. Listen, there are two kinds of knowing. There's the knowing of an outer truth and there's the knowing of an inner truth. An outer truth is the truth that I master. Like the distance of the sun from the earth. An inner truth is something that masters me. It gets inside of me. That is the way we have to know Christ. We do not know about that is what many of our theologians are discussing today. Each gives their opinion about Christ. Listen, the knowing of Christ is exactly like the marriage act. It's called knowing in the scriptures. It's identity. It's unity. It's a kind of knowledge that is almost incommunicable just overwhelms us. And once we give ourselves to him, really, then our whole life has changed. It seems strange that to us who have been in the church for years and are faithful to the sacraments, we have to talk about him, but I took a resolution when I, I really believe I received an inspiration about it. 
When I resigned my diocese, I resolved from that time on to preach nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Because I could see that was the great need. Now I know, I think pretty well, the Catholic opinion in the United States. I certainly know priests better than anyone in the United States because that's my whole work practically, is giving retreats to them. And let me tell you, we've got a great body of priests in the United States. Much better than many think them to be. But what is happening is this. The religious, and I do not mean the religious in the canonical sense, I mean those of us who have religion. The religious today are becoming secular. We're becoming more and more worldly. We can see it in the sisters, we can see it in some of the priests, we can see it in the laity. An unwillingness to sacrifice, to read and meditate on the Gospels. But while the religious are becoming secular, the secular is becoming religious. I talked in 42 secular universities in the last year and a half. In a lecture at the UCLA, 80% of the questions at the end were on prayer and meditation. I could not keep up with the invitations that I received to national conventions, things that you would never expect. For example, next May 13th, I'm talking to the bankers of the United States in their national convention. Talked to the insurance men of the United States a couple of weeks ago, the lawyers of the United States. I say to them, I don't know anything about law, I don't know anything about medicine, I don't know anything about banking. That's why we're inviting you. We want something divine. And the most popular subject that I can talk about in secular universities is the subject of Christ, and particularly his passion. When I talk in prisons, I went to one prison, stayed there a week, talked to 1,979 of them three times a day. And what is the favorite sermon? The seven last words of our Lord. So believe me, we who have the faith must watch out. Remember when Moses was communing with God? Aaron contrived his golden calf. And the lamest excuse that was ever given for anything was the excuse of Aaron. Aaron, when Moses said to him, why did you do that? He said, well, I just put gold into the furnace and it came out a calf. What did Moses do? Moses took the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, out from the people of God. Now he said, if you want to go to the tent of meeting, go out there. And believe me, the Lord is going outside of the people of God today. And that's one of the reasons why I'm retreats. I want to reach everybody. Everyone. To give them Christ. So we must not think that we know him thoroughly. As a matter of fact, if he came back today, I wonder if the poem of St. John Adcock would come true. He begins his poem 
with a child playing with a woolen lion. And then he fancies this lion coming alive. What would happen to the child? When a blithe infant lapped in careless joy sports with a woolen lion, if the toy should come to life, the child so direly crossed to face with this actuality, we're lost. Leave us our toys, then. Happier we shall stay while they remain but toys. And we can play with them and do with them as suits us best. Reality would only add to our unrest. We want no living Christ whose truth intents pretends to no belief in our pretense and flashing on all folly and deceit would blast our world to ashes at our feet. We do but ask to see no more of him below than is displayed in the dead plaything our own hands have made to lull our fears and comfort us in loss. The plastic Christ upon a plastic cross. So we're going to try to make him come alive, and we're all going to try to get back. Let all of those who are making the retreat not come here to a vaudeville show. Say, oh yes, he's good, he's interesting, and the like. Think about what is said. We discover God only in silence. Only in silence. Hell is full of clocks. Now you know what the retreat is to be about. It is only fair to be honest with you at the beginning and tell you. Just as a Boston maid came in one Saturday night to announce to a parlor full of guests, for all who do not like baked beans, dinner is over. And let me tell you that for all who do not like Christ, this retreat is over.